At 0600 hours, four Ukrainian FP-2 drones lifted off from a forest clearing eight kilometers behind Ukrainian lines toward a Russian fuel train in occupied Luhansk Oblast. The last drone had barely cleared the tree line when their control signals lit up across the battle space, revealing their presence to anyone listening. The operators didn't know it yet, but those emissions had already given them up. As the FP-2 settled into their southwest course toward the fuel train, they crossed into the outer band of Russia's electronic surveillance grid, exactly where the first Russians were listening. 20 kilometers north, a Russian R-934 automated direction-finding vehicle had been hunting since midnight. The system looks like a standard military truck except for the four-dish antennas sprouting from its roof, each one rotating independently, sweeping the electromagnetic spectrum from 20 megahertz to 3 gigahertz looking for one thing – Ukrainian drones. When those four control signals went active, the R-934's computer ran them through his classification database in 0.3 seconds. Frequency pattern. 1.2 to 1.4 gigahertz with frequency hopping across 50 channels. Power output, 10 watts per transmitter. The Russian drones used completely different signatures. These signals were definitely hostile. Four Ukrainian drones bearing 247 degrees magnetic. But bearing alone tells you nothing useful. It's a line stretching to infinity, not a point on a map. The signal could be coming from one kilometer away or 100. That's why Russians never deploy these vehicles alone. 25 kilometers northeast, a second R-934 detected the same emissions, bearing 190 degrees. Now the triangulation could begin. Both vehicles reported to a Borisa Glipsk 2 command truck, essentially a mobile computer center that correlates electronic intelligence from across the sector. Here's how the math works. The drone signal travels outward at the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second. It reaches the second R-934 just 0.00008 seconds after the first one. This is the key. The computer multiplies that time difference by the speed of light. This number equals 24 kilometers. That means the drone must be 24 kilometers closer to the first receiver than the second. But how can the difference be just 24 kilometers when the receivers are 45 kilometers apart? That's because the drone sits nearly equidistant to both, like a helicopter hovering between two people, both nearly the same distance away. The computer draws a hyperbola of all positions exactly 24 kilometers closer to receiver 1. Where this curve crosses the two bearing lines, 247 and 190 degrees, that's your target. This entire process, detection, classification, triangulation, took 23 seconds. The automated battlefield management system pushed these coordinates directly to the nearest fires unit, a BM-21 Grad battery positioned 31 kilometers away. The Ukrainian operators knew none of this. They focused on flying four drones simultaneously toward a fuel train that would reach Dovzansk Depot at 0650. Miss this opportunity, and the next train wouldn't arrive for 72 hours. But first, they had to survive the next 90 seconds. The Grad Battery's response required no human decision. Standing orders since 2022. Drone detection triggers immediate suppression. Hydraulics whined as 40 launch tubes elevated to 52 degrees. The fire control computer adjusted for crosswind, eight knots from the west, and initiated the launch sequence. The operators heard it before they saw it, that distinctive ripple of rockets igniting in sequence, not the sharp crack of artillery, but a tearing sound that builds and builds. A trained ear can count them, a full battery salvo. Time to impact, 60 seconds. The team leader knew the odds weren't good. Each 120 millimeter rocket carries 6.4 kilograms of explosive surrounded by preformed steel fragments. Lethal radius, 30 meters. 40 rockets in a hexagonal pattern cover 600 by 600 meters completely. Their launch position sat at the exact center of that box. But the FP-2 drones were still climbing through 1,500 meters, only 10 kilometers from launch. Cut control now and they'd circle back into friendly airspace, looking for their command signal. They needed 20 more seconds to reach the handover point where autonomous navigation would take over. 20 seconds while 40 rockets arced through the morning sky at 690 meters per second. 
15 seconds. The whistling became audible, not a single note, but a chord of approaching steel. 10 seconds. The drones crossed into contested airspace, their onboard computers taking over navigation. Five seconds. The team leader yanked the control unit's power cable. Three seconds. Both operators dove into their vehicle, engine already running. One second. Tires spinning, throwing dirt, the vehicle lurching forward. The forest exploded behind them. Not a single blast, but rolling thunder as rockets walked across the grid square in a six-second barrage. The blast wave caught their vehicle at 200 meters distance. Fragments punched through the tailgate, but they kept moving. Four FP-2s continued southeast toward Dovzansk, now flying autonomously along pre-programmed waypoints. The operators had survived, but their drones were already appearing on someone else's scope. Meanwhile, the fuel train was still rolling south toward Dovzansk at 60 kilometers per hour. It had already cleared the last major junction and was entering the 40-kilometer zone where Ukrainian planners expected the heaviest Russian defenses. Every minute they survived pushed the train closer to the depot and the narrow window where an FP-2 strike would matter. The Russian Tor M2 battery near Staroblisk had been tracking the incoming drone since they'd crossed into range at 38 kilometers. The system sat on a hilltop, its radar with perfect line of sight across the valley below. The Tor's radar is a flat rectangular panel that appears to rotate on top of the vehicle, but it's not really mechanical rotation. This is a phased array that steers its beam electronically. Think of it like having 100 flashlights that you can aim instantly in different directions without moving them. The computer controls which flashlights turn on and when, creating focused beams that sweep the sky three times per second. However, the TOR's fire control system has a specific bottleneck that drone operators exploit. While the search radar can track 48 targets, the engagement radar, a separate KA band system operating at 35 gigahertz, can only illuminate four targets simultaneously. Each illuminator is a narrow pencil beam, two degrees wide, that must continuously paint the target from launch to impact. If the beam breaks for more than 0.5 seconds, the missile loses guidance and self-destructs. This creates a mathematical problem. Four drones approaching from different altitudes and angles means the tour must divide its attention. Worse, the vertical tracking speed, 45 degrees per second, is half the horizontal speed. Drones that suddenly dive or climb can momentarily break lock, forcing the system to reacquire. Ukrainian operators know this and fly profiles specifically designed to stress these limits. The operator watched four contacts approaching in tactical formation. High drone at 2,000 meters, straight and level at 180 kilometers per hour. Middle drone at 500 meters, weaving slightly. Two low drones at 200 meters, using every hill and depression for cover. The low drone suddenly dove even lower. The operator recognized this immediately. They detected his radar switching from search to track mode. When the tour locks on, signal strength spikes from periodic sweeps to continuous illumination. Dive now or eat a missile in eight seconds. Both low drones drop to 50 meters, scraping the earth. The tour could track all four easily. The system handles up to 48 simultaneous targets. But tracking and engaging are different problems. Tracking just requires radar pulsing bouncing off the target. Engaging requires a dedicated fire control channel, a continuous beam painting the target so the missile knows where to go. The tour only has four fire control channels, like having four laser pointers, but 48 cats to keep busy. Against four drones, that should be enough, but the geometry complicated everything. The high drone flew so straight it screamed, decoy. The low drones kept disappearing behind terrain. The middle drone could go either way. Standard doctrine, engage the clearest threats first. But the battery commander knew better. Ripple fire doctrine. Launch two missiles, assess results, then two more if needed. Launching all four at once risks wasting your entire ready load if the first missile succeeds. Against multiple drones, you need ammunition discipline. Two 9M338 missiles erupted from vertical launch tubes. These missiles don't chase their targets. That would waste fuel. Instead, they climb to a calculated point above the target, then dive. The downward angle gives better radar return off the target's upper surfaces, and gravity adds 200 meters per second to impact velocity. 
The high drone maintained 2,000 meters altitude, never deviating. The first missile's proximity fuse triggered at 5 meters distance. 14 kilograms of tungsten fragments expanded outward at 2,000 meters per second. The FP-2 ceased to exist as anything larger than a postcard. 10 kilometers east, the train crossed the Svatov Bypass. Its schedule placed it at Dovzansk at 0650, meaning the surviving drones had less than 30 minutes to get ahead of the locomotive. That's if they made it through the next 30 seconds. The moment those launch plumes appeared, white smoke visible 30 kilometers away, both Lodones dove to the Adar River Valley. But one drone pulled up sharply just before entering. The drone's computer had spotted power lines crossing the valley at 20 meters height through his camera. Either pull up or hit the cables. It climbed to 80 meters, cleared the lines, and then dove back down. The radar operator watched them vanish completely. The ADAR cuts 30 meters below the surrounding terrain. Add Earth's curvature to that range and you get 45 meters of radar shadow. The Taurus beam, no matter how electronically agile, can't bend around the planet. The middle drone tried to evade when the second pair of missiles launched, diving from 500 toward 200 meters. But the Taurus computer had already calculated where it would be in 11 seconds, not where it was now. The missile arrived at the predicted point precisely as the drone reached it. Another expanding sphere of tungsten, another drone deleted. The two low drones suddenly stopped all maneuvering. The high drone, their decoy, had just been destroyed. Any movement now would create a larger radar return, make them easier to track. They went straight and level, minimizing their cross-section, becoming holes in the sky. Two of the four destroyed looked acceptable, but the battery commander knew better. The two survivors were the ones hugging the Earth, the ones carrying live warheads. The destroyed drones had been decoys, trading altitude for survivability, absorbing millions of rubles worth of missiles to ensure mission success. Repositioning the entire battery took four minutes. Lower the radar, start the tracks, drive to better vantage point. Stabilize, raise the radar, recalibrate. By the time they'd reacquired, the surviving drones had gained 12 kilometers. They popped up briefly at the valley's eastern end. The tour launched two more missiles, but the drones immediately disappeared into a railway cutting. The missiles found only empty air. At 0622, both FP-2s cleared the tour's engagement envelope. 60 kilometers ahead, the fuel train was pulling into the Dovzansk depot, but the Russians were waiting. The R-330ZH Zetel had been parked at Dovzansk Rail Depot since midnight, protecting the fuel transfer operation. The system looks like a standard military truck with antenna arrays covering its roof, but those antennas were broadcasting 100 watts of precisely targeted jamming across a 30-kilometer radius. At 0640, both FP-2s entered the jamming zone. Their GPS receivers, tracking eight satellites with three-meter accuracy, suddenly heard nothing but static. That's because GPS satellites orbit at 20,000 kilometers, transmitting at 50 watts. By the time those signals reached Earth, they're weaker than the signal from your TV remote. The Zetel broadcasts noise directly on the GPS frequencies at 100 watts from just kilometers away. It's like trying to see a flashlight on the moon while your neighbor points a searchlight directly at your face. The drone switched to inertial navigation, accelerometers and gyroscopes maintaining heading based on the last known position. But INS drifts. Every minute adds 10 meters of error. After five minutes, they could be 50 meters off course, enough to miss the target entirely. The Ukrainian operators, 180 kilometers away, watched their video feeds degrade as the jamming intensified. The frame rate dropped from 30 frames per second to 10, then 5. Resolution fell from clear 1080p to pixelated 480p. The Zetel was hammering everything it had. But the drone's directional antennas, pointed straight back at the operators, had 18 dB of gain. That's 63 times signal amplification, even losing 90% of data packets. Enough got through for manual control, but it wasn't easy. The first operator fought three problems simultaneously. Control lag. Every stick input took 400 milliseconds to show results, like playing a video game on a satellite connection. Frame drops. The video feed would freeze for entire seconds, then jump forward, showing the drone in a completely different position. He switched to manual camera settings, exposure down three stops to cut through the glare, focus locked at infinity to stop the autofocus hunting. 
frame rate priority over resolution. Better to see 10 frames per second at 480p than 1 frame per second at 1080p. The operators could see the depot through the static, and more importantly, they could see the train. Through thermal cameras, Dovzatsk depot glowed like a city at night. Metal holds heat differently than earth or concrete. The tanker cars, each loaded with 60 tons of diesel, still radiated warmth from yesterday's sun. They appeared as white rectangles in perfect formation. Railroad tracks created two parallel heat lines pointing directly at the target. The first operator aligned his drone with those thermal rails. The video showed a stuttering slideshow. Depot, static, depot, static. But enough to maintain alignment. Three degrees left to the center on the tanker formation. Altitude down to 300 meters. The Zytel operator showed the video link signature on his spectrum analyzer, frequency hopping across the 5.8 gigahertz band. He tried everything in his arsenal. Barrage jamming, flooding entire frequencies with bands of noise, spot jamming, targeting specific channels as the drone hopped between them, sweep jamming, following the frequency hopping pattern trying to predict the next channel. But the FP2's radio hopped 1,000 times per second across 50 channels in a pseudo-random pattern. Even jamming 40 channels simultaneously left 10 channels clear each millisecond, enough for packets to squeeze through. Russian soldiers at the depot were completing the fuel transfer, pumping diesel from train to underground storage. The Zytel operator watched his jamming power meters maxed out, his equipment heating up from the strain. But the video links persisted. Two drones, five kilometers out, 90 seconds to impact. At 0645, the first FP2 struck the third tanker car at 67 meters per second. The 105 kilogram warhead created 50 PSI of overpressure. Tank cars are rated for 15 PSI maximum. The tanker didn't explode, it erupted, like a balloon squeezed too hard, spraying 60 tons of diesel in a 100 meter cone. The burning fuel flowed along the track bed, pooling under adjacent cars. The second tanker's pressure relief valve, sensing heat approaching its 200 degree threshold, opened automatically, venting fuel vapor directly into the flames. The third car's valve opened, then the fourth, Within 30 seconds, five cars were fully involved, each one adding 72,000 liters of fuel to the inferno. The second operator waited exactly 30 seconds after first impact. He needed the secondary explosions to subside, needed a clear thermal picture to identify the depot's fuel storage building through the smoke and flames. At 30 seconds, gaps appeared in the thermal saturation. There, the rectangular outline of the transfer building. He pushed his stick forward. 20 seconds later, the second FP2 arrived from the east, its operator watching the massive thermal bloom from the burning train, aligned with the fuel transfer building, the upwind position that would spread fire across the depot. The drone entered terminal dive from 400 meters. Impact at 0646, the building contained 500 tons of diesel. The initial explosion bulged the tank walls outward, then the fuel-air mixture achieved the perfect ratio. Not too rich, not too lean. Just right for maximum devastation. The secondary explosion shattered windows in Dovzansk three kilometers away. In less than a minute, the Ukrainians had destroyed tens of thousands of gallons of diesel fuel and forced the Russians to put their walking shoes on again. Bye for now.